morning to our church family and to an online community that we have never reached before. Uh, but we are exceptionally excited to be doing church with you this morning. And we are doing church a little bit differently. Um, we are doing our worship differently when it comes to, to song or when it comes to word or, or when it comes to our giving, uh, even when it comes to loving our neighbors. Um, because right now we're standing here with an empty church. Uh, all that we have here with us this morning is our, our film crew and some of our staff uh, who've all come together quite incredibly to make this happen. And I'm just so grateful for everyone's efforts within that. But as you would know, over the past couple of months, the world around us has really started to look quite differently. Um, the nation of South Africa has, over the past few days, started to look quite different. Since our, our president's speech um, surrounding COVID-19 and, and all the, the, the regulations that have been put in place, um, we've, seen, we've seen our nation change. And um, with any sudden change, fear always tends to, to creep in there. Now, I've got to say this, that when it comes to these decisions that have been made, we're always praying for government to make really good decisions, to make wise decisions. And, and I really want to honor our government for the decisions, the very difficult decisions that they've had to make in very difficult times. And not just do we honor them for the decisions that they make, but we continue to pray for them for wisdom in moving forward. And this, this, this issue of, of, of fear that kind of creeps its way into our conversations and, and, and it kind of finds its way into our lives through, through different forms of media that we engage in and just the, the kind of the, the overwhelming feel in, in our society at large. We recognize that, that ultimately fear is just... It's just an emotional response to what's happening around us, isn't it? Now, fear can be both good and fear can be bad. Uh, fear can be good when, when fear stops me from stepping up off a cliff without any safety precautions. Then, then fear is a good thing. Uh, but fear can also be very destructive when I'm purely responding out of this emotion in the moment that is driven by negativity. Now, I've been riding motorcycles my entire life. Um, and one of the very first things that they teach you when you're riding a motorcycle is the fact that where you look is where you're going to go. And The same really applies for life, doesn't it? Where we look, what we focus on, is where we end up going. You see, another thing in writing is that fear restricts me. Fear, fear inhibits me. Fear causes me to, to tense up and, and to, to, to get all rigid. Uh, something else that fear does when I'm, when I'm writing is that, that fear causes me to, to, to get fixed onto a target. We, we call it target fixation. Um, in, in other terms, we could also just call it tunnel vision. Just meaning that all that I can see in front of me is the negative, the, the, the negative element, the negativity that's, that's in front of me, the obstacle, the problem. Um, in writing, it's normally like a, a log or a hole or I'm about to run wide or something like that. But, but ultimately, I just get locked onto that thing and I can't see anything else around me. And normally when that happens, I end up <laughs> winding up in a hole. Uh, very recently, I went riding with some friends um, through, through Swaziland and it was just uh, an absolutely incredible experience. 
And as we were riding, uh, we reached this point where we went up the side of a mountain. And as we were going up the side of the mountain, uh, we reached a point where, where the road wasn't straight. It wasn't quite a corner. It just had this attended to go left, let's say that. And next to this area where it tended to go left was this deep crater, this, this deep hole about, about one and a half meters deep um, that would swallow up a motorcycle if you wound up in it. Uh, and it was about uh, a couple of hundred meters long. So we all go through there, and one of these friends of mine that, that I'm riding with, um, he must have seen the hole. And, and his eyes must have just got locked onto the hole. And as he saw that hole, anxiety and fear must have kind of just risen up inside of his heart. And as a result, he, he must have got rigid and stiff and got tunnel vision and target fixated onto that hole and could see nothing else around him. Couldn't see the way out, couldn't see all the beautiful scenery that we were riding through. All he could see was this hole that he was about to ride into. And guess what happened? (laughs) He wound up in the hole. Now, you may think it's not nice to laugh at that. It probably isn't. Um, But as I came riding back looking for him because he'd been gone for a little while, uh, come riding down the road, and all I see is him standing in the middle of the road. There's no motorcycle around him. And I'm trying to figure out where's this guy's motorcycle. Finally, I found out that it's in a hole. But you see, just as, just as fear may have gripped this guy's heart, isn't it true that in life, when, when fear grips our hearts, when, 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 when fear becomes our focus, it becomes paralyzing to every other area of our lives. We kind of get focused in on the problem. We kind of get focused in on what's wrong. And, and, and it's so hard to not get tunnel vision on that and ultimately wind up in a hole that we were never intended to wind up in. As this week has unfolded, and as I've just been looking at, you know, what's, what's being put out there by media and what's happening in conversations and, 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 and what the feel of, of, of our society around us is like at this stage, there were these words that just resonated through my heart and through my mind over, the, over this past week. And they are words written from, from, from a, a guy seasoned in the faith, if I could put it that way, to, to a younger man who's just passionate about serving God and, and, and living wholeheartedly for God. And uh, it's letters from, from one of the first church leaders of, of the, the first century, a guy by the name of Paul. And he's writing these letters to, to one of his apprentices, a guy by the name of Tim, Timothy. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, we, 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 we have the privilege of having two of them in our Bible today. In the second letter from Paul to Timothy, this is what Paul says to him. Paul says to Timothy, he says, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I really believe that during the times that, that, that we're facing right now within our community, within our country, within the world around us, that, that these words hold life-giving power to you and me. That these, these words really hold truths that we should take to heart. Because you see, the first thing that Paul says to Timothy is, he says to him that God has not given us a spirit of fear. What Paul's saying is that this fear that we're encountering day in and day out, this, this fear that we're seeing around us, it's not from God. God hasn't given us this thing. If we revert back to our, to our earlier story, 
that when you're in those moments and you're starting to feel rigid, you're kind of feeling like you're locked onto a set of rails and you can't get off, but you're just hurtling towards this hole that you're pretty sure you shouldn't be in, but you're just fixated on the negative and, and you just can't move past it. What Paul's saying is that that is not from God. What Paul is saying is that God has not given us this spirit of fear, but that God has given us something. And and, and that he's given us a spirit of power. And that he's given us a spirit of love. And that he's given us a spirit of a sound mind. And that's something worth investigating. That's something worth looking into. Maybe today you're, you're listening to this and, 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 and you aren't a Jesus follower, but you recognize the, the lack of hope. You recognize the, the, the chaos and the turmoil that, that you may be experiencing on a, on a daily basis. And, and, and what you really need is hope. You, you're really needing a lifeline. Well, I believe that in the words of Paul right here in his letter to Timothy, there is exactly that. There is that hope. There is that lifeline to recognize that the fear that we see around us, God hasn't given it to us. But ultimately, he has given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And when we, when we talk about that spirit of power, what we're really talking about there is, is the, the original word that they use in that, in that portion of Scripture is the word dynamos. And dynamos means a force or a miraculous power. It's a force or a miraculous power. And I want to say this, that if you are a follower of Christ, if you regard yourself as a, as a Jesus follower, then we need to recognize that we have that force. We have that dynamic, miraculous power inside of us. And when we think of this, we need to understand that, that this is where our faith becomes faith. Because so often we, we, we claim to have faith, but we live in a way where we can kind of get by by ourselves. Whereas in moments like these, our faith becomes faith. Because it's in these moments that, that we need to start choosing certain things. We need to start choosing not to see the world around me through the lens of the turmoil that I may be experiencing. But instead to start tapping into the dynamic power of Jesus in me. We need to choose to start seeing the world through the lens of the dynamic, miraculous force that is Jesus Christ. As Christ followers, we have the greatest power in us. And as the philosopher and author of Spider-Man, Stan Lee, once said, With great power comes great responsibility. You see, when we recognize the power that we have in us, we also need to recognize that we have a responsibility when it comes to loving those around us. Because that power isn't just in us for the sake of being in us, that power is in us to be effective through us and to love those around us. So God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and of love. This love, this word love that is used here in the original language, uh, it it refers to benevolence. And, And benevolence is really just choosing the good for another. Choosing the good for another. And that is the spirit of love. It's, it's this spirit of choosing 
the good for another. In Luke 10 and, and Matthew 22, this thought just ties up with what Jesus said there with regards to the fact that we need to love God and we need to love others. We need to love God and we need to love others. And I want to say this, in having said that, that is why we are doing church this way. For, for you sitting at home, if you're a part of this family and you're normally sitting in this building, that is why you're sitting at home right now. Not because of fear, but because we are choosing to love others. You see, We are choosing to love our neighbors. We are choosing to to ensure that we are that we are caring for the vulnerable in this time, that we that we are caring for those that are at risk. Uh, Because you and me, we may get through this pretty much unscathed from a health standpoint, but there are people whose systems can't handle what's coming their way or what could come their way. But by us just adhering to the social distancing, what we are doing is we are hoping to break that chain to not reach the at risk and the vulnerable. And this is the best way in which we can love our neighbors during this time. We are choosing to love others. We're choosing to love those around us at the expense of our convenience, at the expense of our comfort, even at the expense of our income. You see, folks, right now we are not fearful. We're not acting out of fear. We are loving. And we are loving those around us. You see, It's in these moments where our response to crisis should be to live out Christ's spirit of love for those around us. Right now, we have this incredible gift. We have this incredible opportunity where things have changed so much around us, where we don't do things the way that we used to, where we've got to rethink the way that we do things. But, but in these moments, it's like we've been gifted this opportunity to, if we haven't before, to maybe move closer to the space where we live sacrificially and not selfishly where we see how can we help those around us. And folks, that is how we love our neighbors. So God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power and love. And thirdly, he's given us a sound mind. When we say sound mind, what we're really talking about is good thinking. We're talking about about sober thinking. We're talking about wisdom. I love the fact that God says, man, if any of you lack wisdom, just come to me and ask and I'll give it to you liberally. And I believe that that as Paul speaking to Timothy here, as, as as (laughs) as, as a Yoda is speaking to a Luke Skywalker, he's pretty much saying to him, man, you need to function in wisdom. You need sound thinking. I love where scripture talks about us taking on the mind of Christ. Because I don't know about you, but, but half of my, my struggles lie between my ears. It's in my mind. Negative thoughts, th- stuff I shouldn't be thinking. And normally it, it ends up leading to, to stuff we shouldn't be doing. Isn't that the truth? But, but when we take on the mind of Christ, we're really, again, coming back to, to, what, um, to what Paul said to us in Romans 12 too, where he just said, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, taking on that mind of Christ. And there may be a couple of areas where we need to, to, to stop functioning in a place where we are so spiritual in our thinking that we are absolutely useless practically 
And I know that there are probably Christians throwing banana peels at the TV screen right now, and that's okay. One of my Bible school lecturers, he always used to say, sometimes we can be so, earth, so heavenly minded that we have no earthly good. And I, I, I so feel like Paul is just addressing that here. Because God is deeply spiritual, but he's also deeply practical. Go read throughout scripture, we see this demonstrate for us all the time. And this might be that time where we are spiritually in our thinking, but we also take on that sound mind and become practical in the way that we care for those around us, the way that we love our neighbors, the way that we look at society and, 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 and lean into society and see where can we help, where can we make a difference, how can my little family be a catalyst of change. And you know what one of the greatest spaces to be able to do that is? is to not become yet another voice of negativity in a very negative conversation. But as we take on that, that mind of Christ, as, as we, we take on that sound mind, that, that sound mind, we, we allow God to, to come and transform the way that we think so that it changes the way that we speak and we become a voice of hope in our communities. It was a friend of Paul's, a guy by the name of Peter, who said this. He said, always be ready to give account for the hope that is in you. Always be ready to give account for the hope that is in you. As a follower of Christ, You have a hope in you. You have the one true hope for the world around us in you. If if you do not regard yourself as a Jesus follower today and you are looking for that hope, ladies and gentlemen, that one true hope is Jesus himself. And I wonder, as as a Christ follower are you ready to give account for the hope that's in you? When you get into these conversations and they, 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 they tend to kind of head towards, well, they don't tend to, they kind of start there these days. It's just negative. Bam. Are you just another voice of negativity in that moment and your thinking looks no different to anyone else in the group? Or have you decided to take on that sound mind to, to, to start thinking in wisdom and then ultimately speaking out the wisdom of God and moving from a critical voice to a, to a voice of hope in your community, in your workplace, in your family, in your social setting. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I wonder this morning, what's your next step? What's your next step? What, what do you need to do next? Maybe this morning you need to step out in that power. Maybe this morning you need to pray. You need to recognize the power of God in you and, and you need to pray. And you need to pray for those who are infected, those who, who are physically taking strain right now. And, and pray for healing. Pray for their families, for for the care that their families need. Maybe you need to pray for for those that are affected, that are facing some financial struggles because of loss of income at the moment. So maybe you need to step out in power and pray. Maybe you need to step out in love and act. Maybe you need to step out in love and and act by loving those around you. Right now, I believe one of the best questions that we can be asking ourselves right now, for you sitting at home, the best question that you can be asking yourself right now is, what does love require of me? When you think about your community, when you think about the affected, the infected, when you think about your neighbors, 
What does love require of me? Maybe today you need to step out with a sound mind and not be that, that, that voice of negativity, just another a voice in the sea of negativity. But maybe this morning you need, you need to step out and be that voice of hope. Take on that mind of Christ. Take on that sound mind and be that voice of hope for your community. I wonder this morning, what's your next step? You see, Jesus said it best when when he said that we are to be like a city shining on a hill that cannot be hidden. Folks, we just listen to what's going on around us today. And we recognize that there's a lot of darkness right now. There's a lot of, a lot of criticism. There's a lot of fear. There's a, long, a lot of anxiety. And with it comes, comes this, this really eerie, dark feel. There is never a better time for light to shine than when things are at their darkest. We need to be that city shining on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you. Lord, that this morning you've just come and communicated so clearly into our hearts, Lord. Lord, that you love us, that you care for us, Lord. Lord, that you have a plan. Lord, that you have a purpose, Lord. That you are the hope that we need. And Father God, I thank you that this morning, that, that as we've just prayed, as we've just, be, just been, been listening to your word and, and, and digging into your word, Lord, I thank you that we can harness the words of Paul to Timothy and understand that you have not given us a spirit of fear, that any fear that, that, that folks at home may be feeling right now, Lord, Lord, that this is not from you. And Lord, I thank you that right now, as folks are just sitting at home, that right now, I want to encourage you, just surrender your fear to God. Right there in your living room. Just say, Lord, I recognize that this fear is not from you. I choose to no longer be fixated on the negative. I choose to lift my eyes. I choose to look to you. I choose to focus on the truth of who you are. And I thank you that you take this fear and that I can live in your hope this morning. Lord, and I thank you that you have given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, I thank you that we can step out in that power, that we can pray for those around us, Lord, but that we can also step out in your love and act and love those around us. And Father God, that we can step out with a sound mind and become a voice of hope for you in a world that so desperately needs hope right now. We love you, Lord. We commit every family to you right now, Lord. And we just pray for those who are sick. And I thank you that you come and meet with people in their beds right now. Love them. Care for them, Lord. Let them know that you are there with them. Will you touch their bodies and bring healing? I thank you for those who who are affected right now financially, Lord. And that right now you show them that you are their source that you are their source. I thank you that we can band together and help each other, Lord. We commit our community to you. We commit this church family to you. We commit those who are watching online to you right now. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to end off this morning with the way that Timothy... Uh, that Paul starts his letter to Timothy 
in Timothy 2 verse 1 and verse 2, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, may God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. And I pray that this week you will function in God's grace. That you will experience his mercy. And that you will live in his peace. We look forward to seeing you back here again next week as we keep doing church just a little differently. We love you. Have a great week.